I'm glad that you had the opportunity to uh, be able to, to meet Margaret Keck, uh, who I see a lot of folks from our cohort here, all of you have seen her on your syllabi, and now you can um, hear from her a bit more in person. You've, you've seen some of her earlier stuff on Activists Beyond Borders. Uh, she's going to talk today on um, some of the environmental work that she's done in Sao Paulo, which also has kind of theoretical underpinnings about authority and, and institutions and stuff. So um, for those who don't already know, Margaret Keck, also known as Mimi to some, uh, teaches comparative politics, Latin American politics, and environmental politics at Johns Hopkins University, where she's a professor of comparative politics. She's the author or co-author of numerous articles and four prize-winning books, um, most recently including Practical Authority, Agency and Institutional Change in Brazilian Water Politics, which she co-authored with Rebecca Abers a couple of years ago, and um, um, available at fine bookstores near you. Um, <laughs> Also, um, Greening Brazil, Environmental Activism in State and Society with, uh, and then before that, Activists Beyond Borders, Advocacy Networks in International Politics. And her first book uh, was The Workers' Party and Democratization in Brazil. Um, she's a Brazil expert, has been doing research there since 1982. Um, Mimi has been recognized by everybody who can give prizes. They've probably given them to Mimi at some point. And uh, she has a reputation of collaborative research uh, that she has tended to co-author a lot and uh, done a lot of work together with, um, with other people, including some of her own students who have helped to uh, build on the, on the research agenda that she established along with Catherine Sakink um, on transnational activism networks. So I'm one of those people. I mean, it was my advisor at Johns Hopkins, and so I'm hoping to continue carrying the flame forward, especially since this is her last year um, as a full-time faculty member. She'll be retiring at the end of this year, so I'm very happy that we were able to bring her um, to UMass Boston and to our program on human security, global governance, and conflict resolution goes before all that. <laughs> um, so, with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to you, Mimi. Welcome. Okay. You should know, by the way, Jeff, that retirement is not the same as death. <laughs> <laughs> and that I will actually still talk to people. <laughs> um, occasionally, in full sentences. We'll see. Um, okay, the presentation that I'm going to make today is uh, on a research project that was not planned. Um, I thought that I had basically finished working on water politics in Brazil um, with uh, the publication of the book that Rebecca Abers and I published in 2013, and with the possibility of publishing a few other small things out of that project. But um, in, uh, in about February 2014, I was following the Brazilian press relatively closely uh, because uh, around water issues because I was looking at the uh, renegotiation of the license between the water utility and the um, and the diversion the water diversion that makes up the main part of the water the potable water supply of the city of Sao Paulo and I'll explain this to you a bit more in a minute um, and I noticed that there was this increasingly severe drought uh, that Rainfall levels were way below, um, not just below the, the median, but way below the historic bottom of rainfall levels for uh, that month. And that keep, kept on being true month after month after month after month after month. And no one seemed to be doing anything about it, and I was very puzzled. Um, it was happening at more or less the same time as California was imposing increasingly strict water restrictions on its population, uh, something that it did uh, when reservoirs in the state were close to 50% capacity, whereas here we were in Sao Paulo um, going down into the uh, level of water below the below the intake level, in other words, below, below what 
normally would have been considered zero, um, and into the minus part of the reservoir. And there were still no quantitative restrictions, and water experts were still saying, this is not going to be a problem. There are no water shortages. There will be no rationing. Um, it will rain. Um, so I found this to be a puzzle. Um, how could I explain this sort of apparent inaction? For those of you who don't know Brazil, um, I thought I would just throw up a map um, and show you a couple of the relevant places. Um, uh, so the, the area that we're talking about here in this presentation, there's, a, there's actually a drought that is covering quite a lot of the southeast of Brazil during this period. But we're talking primarily about the area around Greater Sao Paulo, which is uh, at the I found a wonderful uh, map of Sao Paulo at night from space, um, which was really beautiful, but I thought it would perhaps not be quite so informative for this discussion. Um, the water transfer that we're primarily going to be talking about from the Cantareira Reservoir uh, comes from up, up around here, uh, from the Piracicaba River Basin um, that covers an area uh, that includes the cities of Piracicaba, Campinas, and a number of um, other uh, high water demand parts of the state of Sao Paulo. Anyway, so uh, Sao Paulo is in southeastern Brazil. Uh, metropolitan Sao Paulo is very large. Uh, it includes 39 municipalities, of which six have more than 500,000 people, and one of them has more than um, uh, 9 million people. The entire region is close to, well, I'm sure it's over um, 20 million at this point in history. And the main, uh, there's a large waterway uh, that runs through the city called the Tiete River. Actually, there are a couple of other ones that have mostly been paved over. Um, because that waterway was historically used primarily to generate electrical energy for other regions, um, uh, sort of down mountain from Sao Paulo. Uh, it, it was essentially, the quality of the water in that river was essentially ignored uh, for so long that it became essentially unrecoverable. And so the, that main waterway that goes through the city is, is used um, to generate energy and dilute sewage and uh, drinking water has come uh, primarily uh, not entirely, but primarily through interbasin transfers. Um, some very large ones, the main one, uh, the Cantarena system w that was built in 1974. Okay. Uh, there's a cast of characters in this story that I thought I would introduce at the very beginning um, because this is not a, a, a purely technical story. It's also very much a political story and it's good to have some sense of who's who before I refer to them in a sort of random way throughout the course of the talk. Um, the governor of Sao Paulo, Geraldo Alckmin, is currently serving his fourth term. Uh, his first term began when he took office as the vice governor of Mari Covas after Mari Covas died in office at the beginning of his second term. Uh, and he was then um, re-elected on his own once. At that point, and then he wasn't governor for a while, and then he was re-elected. He's just been re-elected for a second time um, uh, at the end of last year. Uh, he has presidential ambitions. He ran for president once before um, on his party's ticket, um, uh, didn't make it, uh, would like very much to run again. Therefore, what happens in, uh, in how his governorship is viewed um, matters not only for Sao Paulo politics, but also for national politics. Sabesti uh, is the water utility that was um, es established um, to coordinate uh, water and sanitation policy in the state under, a, a, under a, a, a legislation in the 1970s um, that was pretty much of a mess for a long time. Um, uh, and in the early 90s, the state government decided to, during a period that they were trying to privatize just about everything that they could um, 
find that seemed privatizable, they decided that even though it was unconstitutional to fully privatize the water utility, um, they decided to privatize as much of it as they could. Um, part of the reason being um, the, uh, uh, the idea that this was the only way that you were gonna clean up the finances of a company whose finances were really very, very murky at the time, and also potentially get some new investment um, from outside investors. Uh, this was done gradually. You don't want to hear the whole story of this, but at this point in history, 50.3% um, of the shares of Sarvesti belong to the state of Sao Paulo, and 49.7% are privately owned and are traded on the Sao Paulo Stock Exchange and the New York Stock Exchange. Um, by law, um, Sarvesti is required to distribute 25% of its profits to its to its shareholders. This becomes an important um, point as the story develops because um, as Sarvesti's um, profits come mostly from selling water and it is selling less and less water uh, because there's less and less water to sell, um, uh, who's going to get the, the, whether the profits that accrue to Sarvesti are going to go into investing and improving the water system or paying off stockholders is an issue. It's not terribly surprising uh, what decisions were made um, in that case. Um, okay, municipal government governments are responsible for water and sanitation, and they mostly have contracts with uh, larger uh, companies like Sabesti. There are a few that have their own municipal um, companies, but because of the fact that this is a contractual relationship, they have some degree of oversight uh, which they mostly don't exercise. Um, the National Water Agency uh, is, uh, is the sort of top agency that was established when Brazil adopted new water legislation um, in the 1990s, and it, it, was, um, it was set up essentially to, to, to carry out the implementation of the new water legislation. It's responsible for granting um, concessions for, for, for licensing withdrawal of water from rivers that are under federal auspices. Um, if we can get more into, into uh, property law, uh, the property of water and so forth later in the discussion if you want to. Um, but in the case of the controversies that we're talking about, the National Water Agency and the State Water Agency um, both are the ones that decide how much water Sabesti is, in fact, going to be able to use um, given falling reservoir levels. Um, the Ministerio Público, or the sort of public prosecutor's office, has also been tremendously important um, in the course of this because they have uh, the ability to investigate um, uh, possible uh, misdeeds on the part of public agencies. Um, and uh, because there are lots of, of, of young, ambitious, energetic uh, prosecutors um, in Brazil, uh, this agency has been one of the most sort of active um, in actually generating sort of new information about things that are going on in the public sector. Uh, they also bring lawsuits. Uh, the lawsuits are, are very often overturned at the next level, but nonetheless, they, they bring publicity um, uh, into the equation, and they've been extremely important in bringing publicity into the story that I'm telling here. Mainstream and alternative media both have been important in relation to this. Mainstream media mostly for not telling the story, um, and alternative media for trying. Uh, mainstream media in Sao Paulo is very strongly allied with the, with, the, um, with the state governor at the moment. And when he said this is not a problem, the press also said this was not a problem. Um, eventually it became very difficult um, as more and more people in uh, particularly in poorer areas in the, surrounding, uh, in the surrounds of Sao Paulo basically were having their water cut off for large parts of every day, um, it became more and more difficult um, for the mainstream media as well 
uh, to say that there was nothing going on here. Um, and some of them began to break ranks and actually do better coverage. And there were always a few individuals um, who were covering it well. Alternative media um, have made use of a new piece of legislation, um, which is the Brazilian equivalent of the Freedom of Information Act in the United States. It's called the Lei de Acesso a Informações, or Informação, and it's, uh, it works in more or less the same way, that there are various kinds of public information that um, that uh, that accredited uh, that basically people who are doing investigative stories are supposed to be able to have access to. Um, they almost always have to go to court to actually get that access that they're legally supposed to have. But um, okay, uh, okay, and then a few NGOs, not very many, um, have been active in relation to trying to get more transparency on this story, particularly NGO, uh, an NGO in Sao Paulo connected to consumer protection. Environmental NGOs came in very late um, and became active around, sort of began to form a coalition around the, the issue of, what, of drought policy only towards the end of 2014. All right, so the story in brief uh, is that uh, it's the signs of the major drought are already there by the end of 2013. Uh, the water utility begins to draw water from the dead storage in March of 2014 um, and uh, does not institute formal water rationing of any kind, but does begin to provide a sort of discount for people who voluntarily reduce um, their water rationing. Nonetheless, water rationing does start. Uh, it just doesn't start on people who have the political power to protest against it. Um, it starts uh, by essentially a reduction of, of water pressure um, to, uh, to in water mains in peripheral parts of the city um, outside of the sort of wealthy areas. Um, and this is and, and this is particularly difficult for people living in these situations because uh, they mostly don't have water tanks, or if they do have water tanks, they're very high. And in order to get water into a, a water tank that's raised up, you have to have pretty good water pressure. If the water pressure is really weak, it doesn't make it into the tank. And if you don't have a tank at all, then basically, um, basically you, you just don't get water. And so despite the fact that Sabesky said and the state governor said and the state secretary of water resources said over and over and over and over again that there was no water rationing going on, that there was no rotation in service, it was obvious to anyone who went out and looked, and a number of people did, that large parts of the city were having um, their water cut off for um, most of uh, uh, every day, or at least um, for several days a week. Okay, this is just a sort of nice dramatic picture of the, what the Cantarega Reservoir looked like in uh, November 2014. Okay, so how is this possible? It's not like Sao Paulo is this incompetent place. Sao Paulo has the highest concentration of, of wealth and of uh, institutions and research centers and engineers and water engineers and technical personnel um, more generally uh, of anywhere in Brazil. Um, if there are places where there is the technical capacity to actually analyze the situation and come up with, uh, with a solution, it ought to be somewhere like Sao Paulo. You might expect that you would have this kind of um, ignoring of this process somewhere, you know, far out in the boonies or, or whatever. But, but, but Sao Paulo, it has institutions, it has monitoring, it has supposedly monitoring mechanisms for monitoring the actions of those institutions. All of those things are there on paper. Um, uh, and unfortunately, uh, many of them are there only on paper. Uh, 
um, water legislation in the 1990s and sanitation legislation in 2007 both mandate um, a system that is characterized by transparency and participation, which is something that we have not seen um, in this case. Okay, so uh, we're not gonna go into what the causes of the drought are. Uh, people talk about, well, is this a fluke? Is this a new normal? All, all, all of the water experts say that this is really so completely outside of the risk parameters that they work on that it's just, it's just basically a fluke, um, which brings up really interesting questions about how it is that experts understand risk and respond to risk. And I'm not going to get very much into that here either. Um, what I want to do is sort of understand this as a sort of crisis that, that sort of lays bare some of the kinds of coordination problems that exist among multiple sites of decision making in complex issue areas. Um, what happens when you've got relatively toothless regulatory and oversight institutions, um, the ways in which a different, a whole variety of actors have, have experimented with trying to use new accountability mechanisms like the Freedom of Information Act, like the public prosecutor's offices and so on, and the way that the political context, the extremely conflicted political context in Brazil over the last year and a half has exacerbated um, the political polarization around these competing narratives. Okay, so um, just as a sort of perspective that helps us to, to think about some of this, many of you are probably familiar with the Rowan Weber, um, the very old article on the nature of wicked problems. Um, wicked problems being problems in which there's no agreed on definition. It's very difficult to say where the beginning and where the end is in these problems. Solutions to wicked problems have a tendency to beget more problems. Um, there are always multiple explanations for just about every aspect of it that you can think of. Every problem is understood to be unique and planners are not allowed to be wrong because you don't usually get a second chance. Um, this was a very famous article uh, that, that um, came out in the planning journal in 1973, I think. Um, and that's part of what, I, uh, what I'm using in trying to think through this. Another part of it, um, something else that I found helpful um, was the work of Stephen Rayner, who, who's a guy who, who works in science and technology studies who talks about the difficulty that, um, that technical agencies have in dealing with what he calls uncomfortable knowledge. Knowledge um, that institutions, technical institutions, have a lot of trouble assimilating information about risks and dangers that, that fall outside of the, per, the probability parameters within which they work. All institutions work within probability parameters. You have to be able to figure out What's the range of, what, what's the likelihood of something happening? And, what, and, and how, how much should you invest in preparing for things that are extremely unlikely? Um, and how much, on the other hand, should you invest in basically reinforcing your ability to do the things that are more likely? Um, and so, uh, so, things, so things that sort of continuously fall outside of normal risk parameters pose particularly difficult problems for expert institutions. There's a tendency within the ecology of technical agencies for people to defer to those in authority over them and stick to their customary roles. And so people who are like in, who are in charge of the management of the sanitation utility or who, who have high offices in the Secretary of Water Resources um, uh, are, are likely to be able to make statements that lots of people think are doubtful, but, there are but they're unlikely to, ch to challenge them um, publicly. And then finally, uh, governing elites in this situation, as in so many others, have a tendency to discount the future. And I figure that, that, um, that uh, an improbable danger in the future, in other words, the great improbability that this drought was going to continue at the same level that it was going on, 
Um, uh, it was better to risk that um, than it was to risk uh, taking preventive action in the present. Now the problem with this, of course, is that it violates a sense of precautionary principle in that um, the improbable risk is nonetheless the risk that a city or a, re a region of 20 million people is going to run out of water. Um, and, uh, and all of the kinds of, of concomitant uh, issues that relate to that, and not everyone was ignoring it. The military, for example, uh, held a couple of really interesting seminars in which they, they evaluated the security risk um, that was associated with the, with the continuation of the drought. So, um, so okay, so, so I find that Rainer's notion of uncomfortable knowledge helps me to understand why it is that all of these really skilled, well-educated, thoughtful, dedicated uh, water experts uh, in Sao Paulo and in fact in other parts of Brazil essentially just didn't say anything. Um, none of them were, were, were willing to be critical of the, um, of the major positions that were being taken. Um, this was true both, and this was, there, there were two stages of this process, just to jump a little bit forward. Um, after the, the 2014 election, in which Altman was reelected, and before which he really wanted this thing tamped down, um, he decided to take it seriously and appointed two internationally known water experts to his two top positions, one to the Secretariat of Water Resources and one to, the, to be the head of Savesti. For Secretary of Water Resources, he picked Benedito Grada, who is the uh, head of, uh, of the World Water Council, who's a professor um, of, of engineering at uh, the University of Sao Paulo, or maybe it's hydrology, I forget, one or the other, um, who's, who's sort of an internationally acclaimed guy on this, who was one of the first directors of the National Water Agency, and as head of Zabesti, he, he appointed another internationally acclaimed engineer uh, uh, who was, in fact, the head of the first, of, was the first head of the National Water Agency, Gerson Kelman. Now these guys are absolutely at the top of the pecking order among Brazilian water engineers. And um, you did not see, and you do not see, um, in the technical community in Brazil at this point, anyone criticizing decisions um, that they make in public. Okay, um, I am, of course, uh, talking too much at this point. Um, just. Uh, and during also on uh, work that Rebecca Abers and I did in our book on practical authority, um, and I want to just emphasize this point, which is that organizations, particularly new organizations, new oversight organizations, new management organizations, new sort of multi-stakeholder governance organizations, and so forth, just because it says in the law or in a policy that these new organizations will exist and will be made up of X, Y, and Z people and so on and will function in this way, doesn't mean that they are in fact going to exist in a way that makes them able to function in the ways that people imagine. New institutions have to be organized. People who work in them have to make them function in the ways that they're supposed to function. And um, this is a, sort of an obvious thing but it's an obvious thing that in political science, at least, we have a tendency to ignore. We have a tendency to sort of read the rules and say, okay, well, there's gonna be this new institution, and it's gonna do all this stuff. And we don't, but we don't ask what, what happens between the time that someone, someone says, let there be a new institution, and the time that you can actually see that institution on the ground doing something. Um, that's, the, that's the kind of stuff that we basically try to, to think about in our book around um, new water management institutions in Brazil. And essentially it became very clear that building new institutions requires a very laborious process of building the concrete capabilities to do something and the legitimacy 
uh, with other actors to influence um, the way things are being done. Um, finally, those of you who, who know Brazil know that there's a sort of a, a multiplicity of overlapping and interconnected agencies and institutions for almost everything. Uh, part of this is because um, Brazil is always full, every new political administration of Brazil is full of reformers and, and, and they keep sort of creating new agencies that are supposed to resolve the problems that the old ones couldn't, couldn't get rid of, uh, or couldn't, couldn't resolve, but they usually don't, well they're usually strong enough to create these new ones, they're not usually strong enough to get rid of the old ones. So the old ones are still there alongside the new ones, and they still have somewhat of a mandate, and they're still fighting for more of a mandate. And so gradually you get layer upon layer upon layer of um, entangled jurisdictions. Um, water is an area in which this is tremendously true, but it's certainly not the only one. All right, um, I'm not going to be able to um, get into all of this in very much detail, but I decided that just to, to give you a sense of uh, some of the complexity of this process. Does this work? No, wait. I, I snarked this pointer from my brother, and I'm very excited about it. I never actually had one of these things before. Um, okay, so, uh, public agencies are responsible for licensing. In other words, for issuing permits to extract a given amount of water from waterways during a given period of time uh, for particular purposes either to use or to store. Um, this, this, the, this is in the auspices of both the State um, Department of Water and Electrical Energy and the National Water Agency. Um, the licensing uh, uh, includes licensing uh, they, they have to issue licenses for a company like Sabaspi um, that uh, has contracts with, with hundreds and hundreds of municipalities to do their water and sanitation, or with uh, particular municipal or intermunicipal um, utilities, whether they be public or private, um, that also may um, uh, have contracts to do uh, water and sanitation services. Uh, you can't have competing uh, companies doing water and sanitation services in the same municipality, at least as far as I know. Uh, then you have this whole set of institutions that's supposed to be dealing with the regulation of service provision. So you have the state agent, the state regulatory agency for concessions, RCSB, uh, which is supposed to be regulating SubSB and which is mainly made up of former SubSB employees. Um, then you have the state and federal ministerio público, which sometimes work together and sometimes don't. You have the Brazilian Federal Securities Commission, which collects information that is not otherwise available. But I found actually the very best source of information about SABESP is the um, report that it makes once a year to the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission that it's required to make because of the fact that SubSB is traded on the New York Stock Exchange. So for those of you who are looking for interesting, strange sources of information on, um, on uh, public agencies and other places that have private investment, you might try the Securities and Exchange Commission. Um, and state auditing um, bodies are also in charge of, um, of uh, part of the process of regulating service provision. The only trouble is that there's not any coordination among all of these different regulatory bodies in the ways that they're supposed to be doing regulation. Um, there isn't a clear division of labor among them. And um, uh, the results are um, not terribly surprising. Okay, so what happens here? We have a sort of a confluence of causal factors that fall into these into what, uh, what I sort of classify as four different bubbles. Um, uh, one, of, one has to do with the historical uh, development of the city and the ways in which uh, decisions were made about where the water was going to come from and how water was going to be used. This is a really, really interesting story that I won't be able to get into very much here, but people are welcome to ask questions about it. 
Um, there's this sort of institutional jurisdictional ambiguity, ambiguity which I just talked about. Um, there's the ecological question. We have a record low rainfall. Record low rainfall reduces the absorption capacity of the soil, which means that it's much harder to recover. In addition to that, um, you've had a long period of, uh, of removal of vegetation in the areas around the around the reservoirs, and so there are a lot of ecological causes um, to this, uh, for this process as well. Um, uh, the historical develop developments essentially create path dependencies because of the fact that the, the Tietze River was, was meant to be used for other purposes and nobody really ever thought about using it for the water supply. It was degraded to a point that it became very, very difficult to clean up. Um, and at this point, um, when, when, when people talk about cleaning it up, the, the price tag, first of all, most people don't actually believe it's even possible for any price, but the price tag that's put on it is usually sort of in the tens of billions. Um, uh, and so as, 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 as an alternative, um, it's a problem. Uh, when they decided in the 1970s to um, to do a water diversion from the Piracicaba Basin to Greater Sao Paulo to provide potable water, they basically ignored the fact that the region of Piracicaba and Campinas was also growing as a sort of industrial and, and commercial pole, and that it was eventually going to need a lot more water itself, since it's using water from the same basin. And so this essentially set up a, uh, a, an inter-regional water conflict that um, is only getting worse. Um, uh, partial privatization of Zabeski um, produces conflicting mandates um, because of the fact that Zabeski is required to, to distribute 25% of its profits. It has to have profits to distribute. Uh, Zabeski also has lots of restrictive loan covenants. In other words, uh, lots of loans, uh, foreign borrowing, and various loan contracts in which it's required to maintain particular kinds of ratios between earnings and, and debt and so on. I'm not going to get into those because I don't entirely understand them, but I do know um, that, it, that it plays a constraining role on what legally as a, uh, what the privateness of Sabespi allows it to do in relation to making investments in what the publicness of Sabespi um, would seem to be declaring um, an obvious need. And so Sabespi over the last year has um, essentially reduced its investment in sanitation facilities. It has somewhat, it has tried to increase its investment in loss recovery because the, the loss rate on pipes is extremely high. But, um, but insofar as it remains sort of in between being a sort of a strange mix of state company and, and monopoly, um, the, the incentives for, uh, for public service are actually really complicated. Um, the fact that the concession contract for the Cantereira diversion was up for renegotiation in 2014 exacerbated uh, uh, tensions around this drought because it meant that a lot of people were looking at the situation, it meant that the Ministerio Público had already started doing research on what was going on around, uh, around uh, water management of that diversion um, ahead of time. Um, as well as a number of other agencies. So it increased uh, the, um, the sort of political salience. Um, fuzzy jurisdictions I've talked about some. Okay, there's a lot of other stuff going on. 2014, July, you've got the World Cup uh, in Sao Paulo, among other places. Um, there's a sort of major commitment on the part, I mean, Brazilians stayed home during the World Cup because they were terrified that things were going to fall down if, 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 there, was, if there was too much sort of pressure on them. I'm, I'm, I'm serious. I mean, 
the, the, the idea of sort of turning Brazil into a, a, an international show place during the World Cup was actually something that a lot of people thought um, was tremendously important. Um, and so there was, you didn't have a lot of talk during the World Cup period about how there was this tremendous water shortage going on and you had a fairly substantial increase in water use during the period of the World Cup. Um, elections were coming up um, in October, uh, which were both the gubernatorial elections in which Othman was up for re-election and he had to be re-elected, uh, meaning that there couldn't possibly be a crisis going on. Um, and it was also a very, very fiercely fought election at the national level. Um, when Juma Rousseff um, won office, uh, uh, her main opponent, who was from the same party as Altman, but they don't like each other, Aesio Neves, um, uh, lost the election, but, uh, but continued to um, agitate um, during the period after that. Uh, just as the elections were happening, the Petrobras scandal breaks. This is a big sort of scandal of bribery and kickbacks over money spent um, in, by the National Oil Company. It's very complicated. Uh, it, it involves a huge number of people and, a, and an absolutely staggering amount of money and has um, discredited lots of people from all parties, um, but has most, uh, it has not, it, it has not produced a smoking gun um, with regard to the president, but uh, but they're working on it, um, and it it had a, a a really deleterious effect in terms of weakening um, the the workers' party uh, as as a political force during this period in Brazil. And why is this important in terms of the water crisis? Because the political opposition uh, to Othman coming from municipalities and from, from you know, legislatures and from basically from the main political opposition of his party has been opposition from the Workers' Party. And because of the fact that the Workers' Party was kind of, had the rug cut out from under it um, during this period, its credibility was hurt uh, it, its, its organization was hurt uh, for a whole lot of reasons. Um, it was not able to play that kind of role. Uh, some people in it did try sometimes, but, um, but you didn't have a clear base of organization for political opposition to what was going on in terms of policy during the drought in Sao Paulo. In addition, essentially you have all of this sort of agitational political space occupied already. Um, between demonstrations calling for Juma's impeachment and demonstrations against corruption and, and news headlines with a, a new, even crazier uh, corruption scandal every day and, and something like 40% of Congress has already been implicated in one or the other of these corruption scandals. Um, it's really hard to find space to talk about, you know, a drought. Um, so it's it's important in thinking about how this has sort of unrolled, not to focus too closely on the drought by itself, um, because that's not what people were thinking about most of the time. Um, even it, it may be what the people who had to uh, get up at three o'clock in the morning in order to fill their water tubs so that they would be able to wash their clothes during the uh, during the two hours of the day that they had running water in their, in their houses, it may be what they were thinking about most of the time. But it's not what most people in Brazil were thinking about most of the time. And so it kind of, it gets, it gets pushed off the agenda um, a little bit. Um, okay, so uh, what I want to do, so you have this, so you have this sort of wicked problem in which there's no agreement exactly over what the cause of the problem is. According to the government, even after they decide to announce that yes, this is actually a serious problem and that we do need to impose fines for people who, 
who vastly increase their use of water, and there, begin, there begins to be a much more effective campaign on the part of the state government and Sabesti telling people that they should be reducing their use of water, at least some of them. Um, there is no, um, no one is willing to admit that since we've known for more than 10 years that supply did not meet demand in the Sao Paulo area, perhaps there was a bit of mismanagement along the way somewhere and somebody might have thought that doing some investing in uh, improving the water infrastructure of the city might be a good idea. Uh, the idea that, that this was a crisis of management um, has Gener basically has been attacked by the Altman government as pure partisanship. Anyone who says that, this, that, that essentially this, this is a crisis of water management and not a sort of a nature-induced crisis um, is accused of making a partisan attack uh, in favor of the PT and against his government. Um, so the whole the whole, the whole debate about uh, what the cause of this is and how it could be rationally handled has become politicized in a very, very polarized um, um, political context, which has not been um, especially helpful. Uh, and um, statement after statement that there is no water rationing going on that there's nobody who, who loses water for days at a time. There's nobody that only has water a couple of hours at night. Um, there, there are no consequences for anyone for making these kinds of statements. And they're made over and over and over again. So there's this whole sort of world of, of, of misinformation that gets built up. And no one seems to be able to do anything about it um, at all. There are no really powerful countervailing powers in this story. Um, initially, I thought that business might become a countervailing force in trying to push the government to, to, to act in a different way. But as it turns out, there are, uh, the heavy user, the heavy water users like Coca-Cola and, and the American Beverage Company and a variety of other companies already left. Um, very early in this crisis, they moved the, ma the, the ma major part of their production um, to other states. And there's quite a lot of Sao Paulo business that actually pumps their water. That some of the big condominium developments plus a lot of businesses um, get water from the aquifers. And so they're not, um, they're not at, as, as sort of motivated um, to kind of get into uh, a criticism of the government, in addition to which they don't want to get into this big political battle. Um, so the effort to control information ha was largely successful. Um, the Ministerio Público launched a lot of investigations. It, uh, it brought a lot of different institutions to court, and um, those, those cases were pretty much all dismissed on appeal. Um, civil society organizations were largely absent until the end of October 2014, after the elections, when there began to be a coalition of uh, 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 called the Alliance for Water um, that was built uh, uh, by a bunch of people who had actually been working on water issues in Sao Paulo for a long time. Um, and the regulatory agencies, uh, the big ones, the National Water Agency and the, uh, the, and the um, equivalent state agency, DAE, kept asking Sabesti to produce contingency plans and kept asking Sabesti to produce planning um, uh, plans that, it, that, that had more pessimistic rainfall scenarios and it kept not doing it, and continued not doing it, and continued not doing it. And then uh, finally in October, I guess it was after one of the last contingency plan deadlines, Uckman said, 
um, and I sympathize with this a lot, actually. Um, he said one of the, 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 the sort of more interesting political declarations that I've heard from a Brazilian politician, he said, why should we, produ why should we produce a contingency plan? We all know that it would not be worth more than the paper it was printed on. And of course he's right. Um, I mean, Brazil is a sort of a graveyard of plans that have been made and, 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 and um, put in drawers uh, over a long period of time. But to actually say that was, uh, was, was somewhat surprising. Um, the Consumer Protection Agency and the alternative press have tried hard to make use of these um, multiple juridical pathways. Um, one of the more interesting cases uh, that was brought under the Freedom of Information Act um, involved an effort to get Subespi to release the names of, of companies with which it maintained fixed contracts for bulk water, um, by which uh, there were like 500 companies or something like that, um, in which uh, if the company bought X amount of water, uh, then they would get to pay a much lower discounted price on the water, and that price was much, much lower than the price that most consumers paid on the water. Um, nobody knew about these contracts outside of the world of business or whatever <coughs> for a really long time into this process, and all of a sudden, uh, uh, basically, um, by using the Freedom of Information Act, um, one of the alternative press uh, 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 organizations uh, demanded um, that, that the list of these companies be released, in part because these companies were still being asked to maximize their water use in order to get this discounted price, even though this was well into 2014 was well into the period that water conservation was supposed to be going on. So Besky resisted um, uh, releasing the list, uh, saying that this was private information, and therefore it was proprietary. Um, uh, finally, the Comptroller Gen General's office said that they had to release the list. Um, they still didn't release the list, but somehow El País got hold of it. Um, the El País journalists in Sao Paulo have been extraordinarily enterprising during this period and, and have been one of the sort of great sources of occasional exposés. Anyway, they got hold of this list and they published part of it, after which Subespi was essentially forced to release the rest of it. And so here you had a list of major companies, the, all the big shopping centers that had their fountains going and all this, all this good stuff. It was really surreal. It was this very, very strange, um, surreal process. Um, there have been other kinds of creative ways to try and bring publicity to the situation. Um, there was a sort of effort to, it, the, the case was brought up at the uh, UN Human Rights Commission in, um, in Geneva, as, or I think it's in Geneva, anyway, it's in Switzerland somewhere, um, as a violation of, of the human right to water. And so the UN Special Rapporteur on the human right to water and sanitation was required to go and hold hearings, which he did, um, and uh, they then did a report, and he's now doing a report, and supposedly the government is going to have to respond to his report within 60 days, um, according to all of these rules. We'll see what happens. Um, anyway, so, uh, to sort of finish up, is this a question uh, is this simply a question of sort of failure of govern government and governance and management and accountability in a highly politicized situation in which there are no quick fixes? Or, uh, or uh, to be more provocative, was this a success story? It did eventually <coughs> rain. It hasn't rained enough to sort of restore the reservoir levels, but it did rain enough to uh, make it possible for them to dodge a bullet. And uh, while the reservoirs are still under 25%, they're not under 15% anymore. Uh, thus far, the government has managed to fend off all of the judicial challenges to, uh, to uh, its management style. 
Uh, Sabesti did, in fact, succeed in rerouting water mains in such a way as to uh, basically um, take something like three million people off of being dependent on the Cantorero Reservoir and put them onto other water main situations. And, uh, and this did, in fact, reduce pressure um, on the system. Of course, it wouldn't say where it was putting those pipes because that too is proprietary information. But, um, but they, and they did succeed in, um, redu in reducing water use enough, essentially by reducing pressure on water delivery to poor people, um, that, uh, that they uh, were able to reduce pressure on the most stressed reservoirs. Uh, the more powerful people who could have made a real stink out of this, um, were not nearly as badly hurt, and Sao Paulo didn't run out of water. So, politically speaking, um, for, uh, for at least some people who are in this question, Sao Paulo didn't run out of water, and it could have. Had Sabesti, in fact, not succeeded in rerouting those mains and not, and not succeeded in reducing pressure, uh, and so forth, they might very well have run out of water. So some people would say that it did the best possible job of managing the flows given a very difficult situation. Um, and some people would say that demands for participation and transparency in a situation of water crisis at this level um, are idealistic. On the other hand, other people would say that this kind of short-term fix only magnifies the long-term risk um, by, by sort of inculcating beliefs that, uh, that you can, in fact, ignore precautionary principles. And how would we know? The, what, 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 would we, what, what could we do that would help us to measure the answers to these kinds of questions? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so we'll open up for some questions and more interactive dialogue. And please, there are some of you who are no, there are Brazilians here, some of whom are from Sao Paulo. And I would be interested in uh, what you had to say and not just what you had to ask. Yeah, both. <laughs> My name is Ana Maria, and I live in Brazil. I came here on April uh, 2015, so I I was there at the crisis, and I I live at the center of São Paulo. We didn't I, I didn't have my house problem, but uh, what what I see is that we hear a lot about the problem. You know, every day at the radio, at the TV, we knew what was happening. I, I think that was good. For the first time, we are following, you know, what was happening uh, in the city, and that was good. And uh, one thing that I noted, uh, and that I heard a lot, is was about uh, the uh, losing water, you know, those problems of losing water and the Sabesti uh, was, wasn't not there to stop that. So we see that we are um, <coughs> economy uh, with our, our, our house, and we are seeing at the streets uh, the water flowing. You know, I don't know the, the term in English, but uh, that was... Pipes were burst and there were yes, basically water. And that was uh, sad because we are uh, every everybody was uh, trying to keep uh, to use less water, and we see that. And, but everything you you told is <laughs> true. We felt that. Yeah. Um, but uh, we 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 hear also that they are having changed. So all uh, calm down. They, we are fixing this, and uh, all the time we are hearing that. But 
it rains and, and now it's raining a lot there and they say that this is still, uh, the water is still low, but it's raining and, but we don't know the future, right now, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, there is this very, there is this very strong discourse of, you know, we know how to do this, we know what to do, we're doing it, um, and you know, that's not that's nothing new, and it's nothing particular to Sao Paulo. I mean, this kind of technocratic expertise discourse is common in many places and in many situations, and it's been there in Brazil, um, certainly certainly since the 60s and probably before that. But, but I think the media was an important... Uh, the, imme- the media actually opened up gradually. I mean, it became impossible for the media. Um, but, uh, by sometime in 2014, it, it became impossible for the media to deny that what was happening so obviously was happening. And the media gradually began to open up, and it wasn't just a few people. It started, you know, Floyd Sao Paulo started having a Diario da Crisi, a, a sort of a, a crisis calendar where they would have like a chronology of, of things. But what what's what's really problematic is that there is no Savespi has, um, and Savespi at one at eventually, um, sometime, I guess. I guess in early 2015 or something like that, um, Savespi admitted that it was reducing water in the pipes. This is after it had been doing it for like nine months or something already. Um, and um, but it was, and it started putting out a kind of a calendar of where it was going to reduce water um, for how long. The only trouble is that the calendar was really inaccurate. And everyone knew that it was really inaccurate. So that they would say that they were reducing the water for like an hour, except that it would turn out to be like eight hours or something like that. And there was no, there's no independent source of information on this stuff. Either you take Savespi's statistics, or or you have anecdotes. I mean, eventually the Alianza de la Agua started a system where they were trying to crowdsource information on, on, um, on water shortages. And they were asking people to take their phones and sort of click on something. And I don't know how well that's worked. But it, but it, was, it was just one of the things that I found so striking about all of this is that there were not alternative sources of information. Everyone was using Subvesky's data. The hydrology labs were using it, ANA was using it, the, the water agency was using it, Savespi was using it, the regulatory agencies were using it. There were no alternative sources. Yeah. Um, you talk about the uncomfortable knowledge, you explained it, but how do you explain the silence of the experts and whether experts um, at, s- at some point or lent to Savespi? as far as their professional work is concerned, uh, how do you account for that science of the experts? Well, um, okay. There's a tendency when we talk about political appointments in the social sciences to say, okay, you've got systems of governance that have meritocratic appointments, and then you've got systems of governments that have political appointments. And political appointments tends to mean sort of incompetence. And meritocratic appointments tends to mean competence, although that's not always true. The problem is that Brazil has a combination in that it has political appointments of highly uh, expert people. So what? What Brazil has is sort of like four or five levels down in pretty much every major agency um, that is made up of political appointments. About 85% of political appointments are people who are actually in the service, the civil service, who are actually experts in whatever it is that they're supposed to be experts in. But they owe their, their top management jobs 
to the politicians who appointed them or to whoever their mentor was who got them appointed uh, below that. And so it creates a kind of a, a hierarchy of, of sort of a moral debt, I guess you could call it, or something like that. It makes it very difficult, it makes people very unwilling to be critical because that would reduce their likelihood of being appointed to a high position again, or themselves in the future, or whatever. Also, you know, these are, these are sort of the networks of top experts who are, you know, in charge of the professional associations and who are in charge of all the major graduate schools and, and, and who, you know, the, 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 the major hydrology lab, the major hydrology lab at the University of Sao Paulo is almost entirely funded by Sobesk. Um, and so you're not going to get <coughs> critical stuff. So there's a, so there are these sort of, sort of vicious circles that, that get set up. It's very, and it becomes very difficult. It's not that nobody ever speaks up. I mean, that, that would be, a, that would be an exaggeration. There are some, but it's not, it's, it's a surprisingly small number. And it includes surprisingly few of people that I've gotten to know over the years and come to respect over the years and would have expected um, more of. Yeah. Uh, I think from a water management perspective, there's two issues that are, I, I, I think, very in, important to consider for the Sao Paulo draft. And my question to you will be from a more political perspective on that. The first issue on water management deforestation in the Amazon that has been proven to be strongly correlated with the rains in Sao Paulo. And this has not been addressed by Sebastian, and it's not under the jurisdic jurisdiction to address. The second thing is that the solution that Sebastian has created is basically to tap into the groundwater table, and which is a very not sustainable option. Uh, which is running low and they will dry out eventually. So the, you, you. And that's you, part of it. I mean, they're also trying to do more interbasin transfers. They are. But you, 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 you mentioned, is this a, you, you asked, is this a success story? I would say it's more of a lucky story mm -hmm. because it started yes. to rain just right before the last drop dry, mm -hmm. ran out. Yes. So when we analyze this situation of, a, a broader perspective of water management and this very regional or, or citizen, uh, city-wide political system that basically doesn't allow for proper water management. When you analyze the situation from a political perspective, what, where are the, the, the points where we can see some change that's possible? What, what are the actors there that have some leverage to, to flip the situation over when we analyze the policy aspect of it and not the natural aspect of it? You know, I've been, I've been looking really hard to, for the answer to that question. And I mean, at this point, it seems to me that as with much of the rest of the Brazilian political system, uh, there seems, the pendulum seems to have swung to the judiciary. Um, because uh, because the 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 sort of the legislature the legislature is the legislature is all caught up in being accused of corruption, and um, and uh, the executive branch doesn't seem to be doing a very good job of uh, of, of regulation. Um, you know, I'm not I'm not saying that I think that that is at all an ideal solution. The, from a water management perspective also, and I'll, I'll get to you in just a sec, from a water management perspective also, sanitation is actually in a really weird position in Brazil. Um, because in the water management legislation, they kind of kept all, they left out all the complicated stuff. In other words, they wrote, they wrote the water management legislation and every time they came up with, against things that were too politically hard, they basically left them out to be dealt with at some future moment. And one of the main things that was mostly left out 
uh, was sanitation, and the other huge thing that was left out was land use. Um, because anybody who knows anything about water management knows that land use is sort of the most important thing to be able to, uh, to affect. And because land use is a, because this was federal and state legislation and land use is municipal, nobody wanted to touch it and so therefore land use was not included in the water management legislation. They eventually had to do new legislation just for sanitation in 2007 and the relationship between sanitation and water management is really, is, is, is very fuzzy. Uh, Kelvin comes from a world of water management. He comes from dams. He's, he, he was a, uh, uh, you know, he was, he, he was the chief guy at the, at, the univer at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro's sort of famous dams group. And, um, and he thinks of, you know, none of these people can imagine demand management. I mean, they think of water management essentially as manipulating the supply of water. You either get more of it or you get less of it. But actually managing demand, which is what you've got to do where you've got serious water shortages, is sort of falls outside the mindset. I don't know, I mean, Kevin is obviously a very uh, competent guy. Uh, He's also very sort of closed mouth, and, and he's been very good at, at sort of keeping things in house, at preventing information from, from escaping. Um, he will, you'll never see Kelman probably out there commenting on the fact that a 16% increase in deforestation in the Amazon is like not, not cool for the future of rainfall in Sao Paulo especially after years and years in which it was falling. Yeah. So um, I, I wanted to suggest a, a, a factor or an agency that is counterintuitive. <coughs> so I have, um, just for one of my consultancies, worked in Sao Paulo. It was with uh, the Institute, uh, it's called uh, IBGC, Institute Brazilian, I don't speak Portuguese, uh, of corporate governance. Mm -hmm. basically established by the, their version of the SEC. And mm -hmm. um, this is, it reminds me, mm -hmm. as I was thinking about your practical authority, I and mean, the work that we do is institution building and capacity building. Mm -hmm. And it's a very principle-based organization. All volunteers, probably 1,500 business individuals, <coughs> many of them very strong on corporate social responsibility. And, um, and you know, it's, the whole issue of environmental justice does surface in our discussions, but it's interesting to think of them as some of the most influential business persons that you will find in Sao Paulo, because it's, it's, it's the affiliation with this institute is good for their company's reputation, and it's very good in terms of the stockholders. So mm -hmm. there's a real protection of reputation. Well, what's interesting- that, so that stockholder association actually was did at one point uh, sort of make a statement that was like EGC. Yeah. And, and no, not that one. The, the the something the something. I mean, there there are many of them affiliated. I, I forget. Mean, I, I don't mean to digress on yeah. just the one, but but what's interesting for me is to think of um, the way we use language. So I mean, how do you angle it? Because what you just said is so important, which is people protect their positions because it's all politically interconnected, you know, it's the politics, the, the wealth, et cetera, all interlinked, but uh, the, what they would talk about something like the black swan, right, it, mm -hmm. which is high impact, low probability. I mean, this, mm -hmm. would be, this issue would be part of their discussions. They would talk about transparency, angling in on the whole question of, of, of corporations should have transparency in their access to data. In other words, it's interesting to think about how influential institutions, it's, it's quasi-government supported, but it's, it definitely is an influential institution in terms of the analysis mm -hmm. of this type of risk and, and thinking more carefully about what the impact will be. The, the problem is that the ones who suffer always are the poor in these situations. I mean, as you just mentioned. The also small businesses, I mean, beauty yes. salons. 
Yes. When they don't have any water, yes. um, go out of business. I mean, there, there are lots and lots of small businesses that are that But the, really I'm just hurt. suggesting that that is yeah. the type of, of um, that is the type of agent, so to speak, that can be influential. It's, it's just reaching out and getting a dialogue going and bringing the people together that would have an interest basically in the, it's the environmental aspect of that, the corporate responsibility aspect of that. Yeah, I mean, there are, I mean, there's, the, the, the environmental department at the Federation of Industries in Sao Paulo actually is, is, has got a bunch of pretty good people in it. Um, and, um, and they do make really good statements. Um, they don't really have very much power in terms of the Federation of Industries more generally. And um, there are a lot of construction companies that are going to do extremely well out of building an aqueduct that has to go 100 kilometers and, and God knows how high up into the air in order to bring the next diversion. Um, and so, so, so business is not going to be unified around this. But you're absolutely right that there are segments of the business community that do actually take this stuff seriously and insofar as they get themselves I don't mobilized them together. Right. I, no, I, no I, I, I realize that. I mean, there, there are, there, there are, there's potential there, and I would love to see it um, um, mobilized. Yeah. Let's have Sammy as the last word. The pressure. The last <laughs> question. No, no. With the comparison with California, the implication is California has this public process much. I realize California is not ideal either. But, but it's. Um, but it's. The, the, and if you look at the sort of micro process level, California does in fact look somewhat better. If you look at the macro process, both qualities respond by. Uh, um, creating mechanisms for getting less water to poor people, sucking more water out of the ground, and and mm -hmm. the rain. Right. Um, and in both qualities, the, the latter bit works just in time. Which is nice. So you get the nice, same nice happy ending in both cases. Um, well, they may, they may get a lot of mudslides along with them. Well, yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, with one hand. Um, I did I, a key difference between uh, California and, and uh, Sao Paulo here is that Sao Paulo rations temporarily, they just sort of turn off, and California they ration financially. Right. Um, yes. But the, the distribution of water costs is probably not <coughs> that similar. So in California, it heavily, heavily seems to fall on, or seems to be inversely income related. Um, so yeah, I mean, one of the things that the, the whole agriculture question in California is, mm -hmm. is also, I mean, the, the overwhelming majority of, of water yeah. use in in the region we're talking about in, in, in Brazil mm -hmm. is is urban, whereas in California, the overwhelming majority of water use is agricultural. And that changes the politics of it a bit, I think. It changes you know, the politics of it a lot, but I wonder how much it changes the end result. I don't know. Make a really interesting workshop. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We'll talk. Okay. I drove through the Central Valley uh, about a month ago, and it was dry. It was crazy. I've never seen anything like that. It was just total dust. 